Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen and living Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today, uh, like our Old Testament, is taken from the uh, book of Isaiah, but this time chapter 64 where we read, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you are angry, and we sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There's no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and it made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is God's word to us today. Well, on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students at Concordia University, Wisconsin, I uh, bring you greetings, and it's uh, good to be here again with you as a partner in ministry. And, and it's so important for us, certainly, to keep that in mind because what begins right here in the waters of baptism continues on through your school, as Pastor mentioned, and on to places like Sheboygan Lutheran, and then on to one of our Concordias. God is at work, and the ministry that you carry out here continues through all of those seasons in life and well beyond. And it truly is our privilege to walk alongside you in that work. Well, I'm pleased to report to you that uh, life continues on at Concordia. Uh, the students have now completed seven weeks of class. They're back at it. And in fact, uh, this weekend was family weekend and homecoming and and a lot of uh, excitement surrounding that. A lot of people on campus yesterday. Uh, a lot of them looking for hot chocolate, though. That was the funny thing about that. Uh, but it, it's been good, a good start to the year. You know, one of the things uh, that's unique about Concordia, Wisconsin, is all but one of our buildings are connected. If you've never been to campus, all the buildings are networked together. And because of that, uh, students what they wear when they arrive in the uh, early fall or late summer, they keep wearing all year. Uh, very common apparel would be t-shirts, shorts, and flip-flops. Well, when you see the t-shirts, the it, it's always interesting to me to see what they're trying to communicate. And that's, in many cases, what they're doing. They are pointing out or trying to send a message about something, to tell people about something. Maybe it's something they support or an event that they've engaged in or someplace that uh, they were this summer. Very, very common. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, it was pretty typical to see these sort of greenish t-shirts that had looked like a, um, a head with some antlers on it. And across the front it said, fear the deer. So, of course, those were fans of Milwaukee Bucks, right? And then until just recently, uh, you would see blue t-shirts for the Milwaukee Brewers. Now they have like this circle with an X through it or something. So sad about the poor Brewers. And, but Packers, they're still doing well. Hopefully that continues today. And we see things from places they've been, maybe... Uh, like I saw one young lady recently in class with a Gatlinburg shirt on. But students aren't the only ones to wear t-shirts, right? Uh, we adults do as well. 
In fact, uh, this is one, it's uh, sort of a favorite of mine. It's a nice bright color, nice red. This is uh, a shirt that I received when I ran the uh, New York City Marathon back in 2017. Great run. Uh, and one of the things that made it especially memorable is that I was able to run it with our president at that time, Dr. Ferry and his wife and his son-in-law, and it was, it was great. And then 50,000 some other people as well. And I actually like to run. Now that's two words you don't find in a sentence very often, right? Like and run. But I do, and, and so it's a great t-shirt. But another t-shirt that we've seen on campus a lot this year is this one. Not the most exciting color, is it? In fact, but, but the color has a name. The color of this shirt is called clay. Who knew, right? Clay. And on the front, it says, shaped with purpose. Isaiah 64, verse 8, campus ministry team. And on the back... One of the verses that I just shared with you from Isaiah, it reads, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. That's a message that our campus ministry students want to spread around the campus and share with them. You see, that verse is our theme for this academic year. And it's a theme that's chosen not by the theology department, not by the president, but chosen by students. A theme that speaks to them in their season of life as they gather at Concordia and see themselves as the clay in the hand of the potter being shaped for his purpose. And campus ministry is really focused on that this year. What is God preparing us for? How will God use us now and in the future? You know, it's important to recognize, too, that on a college campus, you have all sorts of groups and organizations and clubs and things like that. But at your Concordia, no group is larger than campus ministry. I think that says a lot about our students and what they choose to be involved in. Well, this passage from Isaiah, a lot of people aren't all that familiar with it. And to get a better sense of it, it's helpful to step back and understand a little bit more about its context. You see, the prophet Isaiah, like so many of the Old Testament prophets, was sent by God, proclaimed God's word, called the people to repent, that is to turn back to God, to seek after him. And at the time of this writing, call it around 700 B.C., the people of Judah, the southern tribes, remember at this point already, Israel had become a divided kingdom. You had the tribes of the north, Israel, the tribes of the south, Judah. And the tribes of the north, Israel, over and over again, idolatry, turning away from God, and despite the great prophets sent to them, they did not repent, they did not turn, they stayed in their sin over and over again until finally God said, enough! And in 722, destroyed, taken away, scattered. Well, those in the south, they looked at that and they thought, we have Jerusalem, we have the temple. Not so bad. We're okay. They left us alone. We're good. But Isaiah knew, knew differently. The time would come. They needed to repent and he called them to such and while on the surface things might not have been so bad, they had been spared. At their core, they were rotten, sinful, unclean, in need of repentance. And so this prayer of Isaiah points that out. You know, we have to pause, though, at this point, too, and consider how different are we are we as a people and we as a nation? We might think that, oh, you know, things aren't so bad. You know, we'll get past this COVID thing and life will be grand and we'll just cruise along. And 
But look at the spiritual condition of our land. But lest we always think it's out there, let's look in here. Reflect on our own hearts, our own lives. It's one of the reasons why it's so important to gather here in God's house on a regular basis every Lord's Day where we come before him bringing our sins, bringing our cares, bringing our burdens and pour them out in our liturgy where we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors, ourselves. Are those simply words we say or do we really reflect and realize what we've done? If we do, if we do, we have nothing more to say than as we did today, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And God, who is faithful and just, forgives our sins. And your pastor has that distinct privilege to say that in the name and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. Those sins are forgiven because of what Christ has done for you. And so we are set free. The burden is lifted because of God's incredible love for you. And that's that same good news that we can declare to our students. And it is what makes Concordia so different. You see, here in Wisconsin, we are truly blessed. We have some great public institutions where you can get a very, very fine education. And if that's all you want, that's what they'll give you. World class even. But at your Concordia's, not only will you receive a great education, but you will also have something that no public school can offer. And that is to hear both God's law and most importantly his gospel, the good news that God loves you and that in the ups and downs of life, the trials, the tribulations, the joys and the exuberance, that you have faculty and staff and other students who will walk with you and help you grow in that love of God in Jesus Christ. And that's a difference. That's a difference for all of eternity. Isaiah, as he's proclaiming, as he's preaching and teaching and now offering this prayer, He makes that so clear, that need to turn back to God. Let me share again. Behold, you were angry and we have sinned. In our sins we've been a long time and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind. They take us away. There's no one who calls on your name who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and it made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. That's the truth. But God also shows his love. And Isaiah knows that as he comforts the people. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. That's not just true for college students. It's true for you as well. You know, our our students, they don't wait until graduation to start living this out, to see what God is going to do, how God is going to shape and mold and use them for his purposes. Let me give you one example. When you hear these two phrases, think of what comes to mind. Ready? College students spring break. All right, you got the picture. Some not great images come to mind at times. But let me tell you about so many of our students who choose to give of their time, give of themselves during spring break to go on mission trips truly all over. I'm in my 15th year at Concordia 
And over the years, I've had the opportunity to travel with some of them, and what a marvelous experience that's been. To see the hearts of these young people as God works in them, to shape them for his purposes. I remember one year, we left on Friday, the beginning of spring break, and uh, on the buses, we drove down to El Paso, Texas, and then transferred over to some vans, then crossed over into Juarez, and there we traveled to a church where we were going to be spending the night uh, and that week, in fact. And on the way, we saw these structures. They looked like a uh, wood palace tipped up on end, strapped together, tin on top, tire holding it down. And I thought, having grown up on a farm, oh, that must be where they keep the sheep or the goats or hogs, something like that. And then you see the kids come out. That's poverty. One fellow we met, his house was made from corrugated cardboard he had gathered. You can imagine what that's like when it rains. Start over. And so our students were there working with a ministry called Casas por Christos to build a home which for many of us here would be more like a garage. But it provided them with safe secure shelter for this family, their children. After the house was done, and, and you can build a house like that with enough students in three days, we gathered around. We had had a Spanish Bible that the students had each written on the inside cover, a word of encouragement, a favorite Bible passage for them. And as we gave them the Bible and the keys to the home and, and gathered around calling upon the Lord to bless that family, there was not a dry eye in that group. Seeing how God was using them to bless others and to share his love with others. But that's just one example. And again, it's not just students who are called to lives of service, lives of purpose in Christ. You know, as, as Lutheran Christians, many of us, in fact, had that uh, passage from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 as our confirmation verse. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. But unfortunately, too many stop there and think, done. Christ has done it all, and indeed he has. And so I have nothing to do. But we forget that there's a verse 10. And this verse is one we must not forget either. For you are God's workmanship. You have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has ordained in advance for you to do. And it's true for all of us. You know, a wise pastor once, you know, we were talking about this, and, and we pointed out how sometimes... You know, young people will say, oh, well, I'm too young. Or more senior folks will say, I've done my service. I've been on all the committees. I've done all my work. It's time for the next generation. I'm finished. He said this, if you're not dead, you're not done. You got that? If you're not dead, you're not done. As long as we have breath, life and breath, God has a plan and a purpose and work for us and continues to shape and to mold us. For he most certainly is our Father. We are the clay in his hand. And he is fashioning us for his purpose. What purpose does God have for you in your life yet? I don't know. But he does. And he will continue to work in and through us until that day when Christ returns. So until then, may all that we do give glory to him in the name and for the sake of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the peace of God that is beyond our understanding may keep your hearts and minds in that faith unto life eternal. Amen. Amen.